Effective leadership principles are universal. So for example, you know, when you need to take a hill in combat or build a strategic plan for a product launch, the leadership principles are translatable. And what I mean is that, you know, in any setting, you have to assess your battlefield uh, to uh, accurately assess your troops. Uh, and also three, uh, build a plan that everybody can believe in. Hello and welcome to the Game Changers She Talks, brought to you by Credit Suisse. I'm Yvonne Chan. In this video series, we want to share stories of women whose lives and work experiences in the technology space will inspire young generations of female innovators and creators. Sharing their stories advances the leading and innovative ideas that they care about, creating a positive ripple effect. Today, we shine the spotlight on the UN Sustainable Development Goals of Quality Education and Gender Equality in the Tech Industry. Women represent half of the world's population, but only make up 29% of the workforce in STEM fields. According to a UNESCO report, only 35% of global STEM students in higher education are female. Meanwhile, the CS Gender 3000 report reveals there is a small number of women in senior technology roles, and among STEM industry CEOs, only 3% are women. The challenges that girls and women face in the STEM fields reflect broader gender inequalities common all over the world, which reinforce the barriers to achieving academic and professional success and hamper women transitioning quickly to jobs of the future. Today, I'm delighted to be able to speak to a successful female entrepreneur in the health tech industry who has surmounted these barriers and is paving the way for more females to follow by creating a gender equal workplace. I'm joined by Grace Park, co-founder and president of the highly acclaimed patient empowerment platform, DocDoc. Doc. A former US Army officer, Grace has over 23 years of leadership experience, 10 of which were spent in international healthcare at Fortune 500 companies. Welcome, Grace. It's good to have you here with me today discussing gender equality in the tech industry. Thank you, Yvonne. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Wonderful to have you with us today. Uh, Grace, you know, you've had wonderfully diverse experiences ranging from your time as a U.S. Army officer to the corporate world and then to entrepreneurship. So let's start with your years as a cadet at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Um, what was, how, was it challenging being one of the very few females in the military? Yes, uh, Yvonne, thanks for the question. It's hard to believe that I'm at a stage in my career where, uh, you know, I can look back to provide this much context. <laughs> you see, uh, when I shut my eyes, I still feel the same way I did when I was 17. The body breaks down, but the soul remains. <laughs> so here I am at nearly 50 years old, uh, talking about the beginning of my career. So yes, there were uh, challenges that um, we had faced. So I had faced, um, so I'll just dive right into it. So when I yeah. joined the military, only 10% uh, of the cadets were women. And this was uniquely exciting and challenging at the same time. And so there were lots of challenges uh, I faced as a minority. Uh, first is that whatever any woman did, uh, it was a reflection on all women in the service. Uh, you know, this type of environment uh, made it difficult uh, to be exceptional. If a male cadet failed, he represented himself. But if a female cadet failed, she represented all women in uniform. So this is what all pioneers face. It's overcoming a stereotype, which oftentimes is not positive. And second, I would add is that there are some people who just didn't want women in the military. You know, it's much harder to succeed when you're in an environment where people cheer for your failure. I was lucky. Uh, in that I'm wired a, a bit differently from most in that I drew motivation from overcoming unjust stereotypes. 
And the third I would say is that size matters. At 17, I was a, a little girl. In comparison, the, the guy to my left was double my size and a football player. And the guy to my right was uh, one and a half size of my size and a member of the wrestling team. Point being, uh, physiologically, uh, they were physically stronger than I was, and yet we had to carry the same size and weight rucksack and go the same distance. So to be successful uh, in this environment uh, required that I foster an objective view of reality mm -hmm. so that I could build an effective strategy to compete. And so there was no room for victimhood or drama. So you were only 17 when you became a, you know, a U.S. military cadet. And, and one of your first answers really struck me. Your body is broken, but your soul is not. And you came out from the experience a lot stronger. No uh, you know, victimhood uh, in your kind of belief and self-thinking. How did you translate that experience in the U.S. military to the corporate world where you spent many, many years? Right. Um, you know, as my uh, wonderful colleagues in Indonesia like to say, same, same, but different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so whether you're wearing camouflage or Gucci, mm -hmm. effective leadership principles are universal. So, for example, you know, when you need to take a hill in combat or build a strategic plan for a product launch, the leadership principles are translatable. And what I mean is that, you know, in any setting, you have to assess your battlefield uh, to uh, accurately assess your troops. Uh, and also three, uh, build a plan that everybody can believe in. And, you know, you also have to walk the talk, getting your hands dirty, you know, being in front of the, in the front lines with the troops to be able to listen and empathize. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there is another operational reality, which is necessary to getting things done in any large organization, and that is politics. Uh, so as I uh, climbed up the military hierarchy and I completed my service as a captain, it was clear that I needed to be effective in a patriarchy. And so uh, to do so, I need to uh, build alliances with powerful advocates. And this is equally true in corporate. And I believe what's important to gender equality is that alliances can be built across many dimensions, uh, which transcend gender. And then how about, what other ways do you think we could go about promoting better gender diversity? Uh, at the corporate level, even at senior leadership roles, Grace? Right, um, that's a good question. You know, I think that large organizations, uh, they can help mitigate this complexity by allowing their star performers to step out for extended periods of time and to uh, subsequently step back in, recognizing that they might be in a different cohort, but they are still high performers. The natural progression of this thought is that their women leaders will be older than their male counterparts on average, right? As they ascend the leadership ranks. And just very quickly, Grace, because you're also in the health tech industry, was there anything unique about gender equality there? Uh, you know, the, the problem of the gender diversity issue is also highly present in the healthcare sector. You know, you could see this in the statistic where women in entry levels are overrepresented at 66%, and uh, middle management is also well presented at 59%. But at the senior ranks, it drops down to 33%. And then on the board levels, healthcare is at 21.6%, which is similar to most other industries. Uh, so, you know, as reported by the Credit Suisse gender, uh, gender report, so, you know, while I'm not advocating uh, for a system that ensures equity of outcome, 
I, I do believe that as corporations move towards a more meritocratic system, you know, we'll see a more balanced picture uh, in senior ranks. So, uh, for example, if I were to take two years off on the corporate ladder, mm -hmm. I should not be blocked or knocked out from being a candidate for the top spot, but be moved into and compete with a different cohort. Uh, so what about Dog Dog? You started your own company now uh, and it's highly successful. What's the gender balance like there? So at Dog Dog, uh, we operate in multiple countries and have over 70 employees in seven different countries. And I'm uh, proud to say that we're split down the line, down the middle, 50 50 wow. uh, between male and female uh, colleagues. And that is uh, without instituting a quota. How did you foster that culture of diversity and inclusion at Doc Doc? So, you know, we haven't focused on gender balance as a goal. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we have hired for skill. And, you know, what I think is that much like genius and other forms of innate talent, we believe that expertise is normally distributed throughout society. So therefore, a meritocratic process uh, should result in a, a balanced outcomes, uh, you know, with all things being equal. That's really fortunate um, that you have this in Doc Doc and that you were able to hire based on meritocracy, but there's still so many women that are underrepresented in the tech space. What more do you think needs to be done to get women into, a foot into the door at, at, in tech? Because right now, even in the STEM fields, right, some of the numbers uh, of female representation, they're really dismal. This has to start early. And, uh, you know, we should and are exposing our children to STEM at a young age. Uh, and so to build a strong society, uh, we need to increase the literacy in STEM. And by doing so, we will have more women in STEM and technology going forward. Mm -hmm. it, I also suspect that our experience, uh, you know, in dealing with COVID will bring more women into entrepreneurship uh, because it brought in workplace flexibility. Uh, you know, the work at home phenomena will uh, help women yeah. stay on the corporate career fast track. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, you know, allow them to be entrepreneurial leaders as well. So, you know, while managing families at the same time. But, you know, let's wait and see where we are in five to, to 10 years. Uh, but I have to say that it is quite encouraging on the ground lately to meet so many new female investors who were, uh, you know, either successful entrepreneurs or corporate executives or running their own family offices. And so I, I, I do sense that there is a greater focus on ESG matters moving forward uh, with more women leaders taking the helm as investors and entrepreneurs. That's so encouraging to be able to witness during a time uh, such as the pandemic. Grace, I also wanted to ask you if not just in STEM, but say uh, other females, uh, women, and young girls uh, who might be interested to join other industries, how, how would you go about nurturing the next generation of young female leaders? I, I try to cultivate in them a, a success mindset, you know, the way I mentor a male versus a female is actually similar across most dimensions. It, it begins by fostering a success oriented mindset. And so, uh, you know, that encourages, um, you know, calculated risk taking ownership, hard work and optimism. And, uh, you know, the key distinction I would make is that. I often find that women require a higher level of certainty before taking action or speaking up in meetings. Uh, so I often encourage my female mentees to be bold and brave and err on the side of being a bit brash, right? Because it helps to strike the right balance with their male counterparts. So you mean we don't need to know the answers for everything before we embark on a decision? Is that something like that? Well, it's, it's that level of distinction, right? I remember in the military, oftentimes I needed to know a hundred percent 
hundred percent whether I was absolutely correct before I said anything, right? Because there was a zero defect mentality that was in my head. Whereas oftentimes the other members in the room had an 80%. In, in startup world as well, no one has perfect information. We're going off a false assumption that there is such a thing as a hundred percent information. We have to make some key decisions with less than perfect information. And so step up and make those decisions and, and speak your mind uh, because that is the culture and that is what is uh, happening in the workplace. You're absolutely right. No one has a hundred percent perfect information and therefore there is room to make decisions and stand out, right? And stand by those decisions. Uh, Grace, you also have a very touching personal story to share with us. Um, it's about Doc Doc and how it was founded on the need to care for your daughter. Um, can you share with our viewers today as a mompreneur, uh, you were basically looking after two babies, right? Doc Doc uh, and raising your daughter at the same time. What were some of the key lessons and experiences you've gleaned over the last few years, uh, juggling both your career and your daughter? I mean, what would you share with uh, our viewers today? Up to this point, uh, you know, we talked a lot about skills and, and not really about the motivations to continue to endure. And, you know, it's easy to say adapt and overcome, but you know, I believe that the, the greatness resonates from the why, you know, why do you have to do what you do? And there is no how that cannot be found if the why is big enough. And so, um, you know, when my husband and I founded what, uh, you know, when our daughter needed a liver transplant at hundred days old, uh, you know, it, it was a completely unacceptable status quo. And uh, for us, it was a problem that we had no choice but to solve. So what I would tell a young person is, uh, you know, a young woman uh, coming into the tech space or, you know, wanting to be a mompreneur, you know, don't aim at success, but to throw yourself at a problem that needs to be solved with complete and utter reckless abandonment. You know, embrace the journey, especially as the mompreneur, uh, you know, both the highs and the lows. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, the author and survivor of Auschwitz, uh, you know, nailed this one when he said that uh, for success, uh, like happiness uh, cannot be pursued. It must ensue and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. Wow. Grace, you've had so many accolades to your name. Uh, when I was reading your bio and watching your videos uh, and, and you've got medals and, uh, and martial arts as well and and you've held so many senior leadership positions in the corporate world and now a successful mompreneur what are the two words that you would say to your daughter today or to any young girl who looks up to you i i i would say um that bring out the warrior spirit in you uh, you have it inside of you and, uh, you know, don't shy away from the obstacles because sometimes it might just be your defining moment. Beautifully said, bringing out the warrior spirit and don't shy away from the obstacles because it could be your defining moment. I really, really like that, Grace. And I really enjoyed our conversation today. I think personally, as a uh, as a fledgling mompreneur, I've got a lot to learn from you. And uh, your story is also very inspiring. And my biggest takeaway from our conversation is increase your learning agility. Even if something was really difficult or you have the mindset that says, I don't do that, or like programming is too difficult for me. Come on, girl. Get a little bit more elasticated, <laughs> a little bit flexible. What do you say, Grace? What do you say? Go for that? it. Exactly. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Thank you so much, Grace. Pleasure to speak to you. And I know our audience would also feel very inspired by your sharing with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And thank you so much to the Credit Swiss team. 
Oh, you've been watching another episode of The Game Changers She Talks, brought to you by Credit Suisse. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.